All right. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming out early on a Saturday, at least early for me, on well, any day, especially Saturday. Uh, all right. So um, what are we talking about today? Um, well, what I'm going to be talking about, in, in some sense, um, you, you could argue, is kind of about what happens after you do a lot of what we are talking about at this conference. Uh, much of the rest, many of the rest of the talks are sort of trying to figure out ways of modeling networks um, to capture behavior or other kinds of things. Um, but um, I'm sort of interested in the question of if someone has, has somehow come up with a network model, um, and maybe they did that uh, by some kind of, say, game theoretic model, maybe they did it by going out and applying a statistical technique, whatever it is, but if someone comes to you and hands you some kind of stochastic network model, um, how do you know what it does? Uh, what can you say about its behavior? Okay, and that's a, that's a problem that's actually... Um, uh, still quite a live one. There's been enormous progress in the last couple of decades on uh, modeling networks uh, as stochastic processes, and um, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that, although that's not the main focus today. Um, a lot of folks have been involved, including, uh, for instance, uh, Mark Hancock right you know, here in this room in, in doing that. Um, so the good news is that we have come a long way in our ability to take networks that have complex properties like um, uh, heterogeneity, so things going on in one part of the network aren't the same as things going on in another part of the network, or dependence, what goes on over here affects what goes on over there, um, to um, you know, simulate models that kind, to fit them to data, and so forth. Um, but we haven't as much progress in understanding um, especially analytically, sort of uh, what their behaviors are. Um, today, sort of state of the art in most cases, if you give me a general model, I can simulate things from it, um, but otherwise I can't say too much of what's going on. And there are some special case exceptions. So, for instance, I think the very important work that uh, Matt's been doing in terms of game theoretic, in, in a game theoretic context, you can look at game theoretic properties of game theoretic models. But if you have a sort of very general kind of class of models, you might want to be able to say stuff, and, and that we don't have as much on. Um, so, what I'm dealing with today is kind of one approach to this issue. Um, to sort of sketch where I'm going to be going. Um, I'm going to use some ideas from uh, stochastic process theory um, uh, to take a random graph that has sort of very general structure, so it's not a simple random graph that you're kind of familiar with, uh, but that might be dependent, might have heterogeneity, um, and bound the behavior of that network using uh, what we call Bernoulli graphs. These are the random graphs, quote unquote, you're probably familiar with, where every edge is independent. And those are things that we understand very well and we can do a lot with. Um, and there are some nice applications of it, and um, assuming that I don't run uh, over time, I will even show you a few of them. Uh, so we'll see what we can do with this. So um, the kind of outline of uh, how I will do this, um, I'm going to start by giving a kind of introduction um, to random graph models in exponential family form because it's convenient to work with them that way. That's a review for some of you and for others it may not be, but I'm going to start there. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, method that I'm using here, which is this bounding method um, using Bernoulli graphs. Um, I'll then talk about uh, two applications of that method um, and then wrap it up. So to um, begin at the uh, beginning, um, we're going to have some notation, I, uh, unfortunately. Um, and uh, so you might as well know what it is, as opposed to having that be a surprise. Um, so uh, here's notation I'm using. It's pretty standard. Um, we're interested in graphs here, um, which of course are, we have a vertex set and an edge set. Um, I'm going to assume that in any given graph, the, um, uh, the vertex set has a fixed cardinality. That is, the graph's got a certain number of people in it. Although, we will consider cases where we think about sequences of graphs where, um, of increasing size. Um, but for any given graph, uh, we assume this is fixed and the vertices are identifiable. Um, I, of course, the edge set is often going to be random in the cases we're dealing with, um, in which case we say the graph is a random graph in the general sense of the term. Um, when we represent graphs, often we're going to do it through adjacency matrices, right, which are very uh, common and simple way to think about these things. So we can think about an n by n dichotomous matrix. There's a 1 in the ij cell if there's a tie from i to j, otherwise not. Um, and of course, this will then be a random variable if we have a random graph. Um, and I will in general use lowercase um, letters to indicate realizations and uppercase to indicate um, random quantities where that is relevant. Um, and then likewise, when we talk about sets of graphs um, or matrices, I'll use this sort of script stuff so that generally you know what that's uh, going to be. Um, uh, one other little piece of notation that um, was going to come up, which I'll add as a, a kind of convenience, um, and I'll mention again, we run into it. Um, but in some cases, we're going to want to take a matrix and we're going to want to sort of perturb it in a particular way. And so I, if I write down a matrix Y and I say Y i j plus, that means I'm going to take the matrix Y and I'm going to take the i j cell and I'm going to force it to be 1. And if I say yj minus, that means I'm going to take the uh, matrix y, and I'm going to force the cell to be 0. Okay, and so that's just um, perturbing it. 
Um, likewise, if I say yij um, superscript c, that refers to all of the cells of matrix y other than the ij's. Okay, and we're going um, to foreshadow why we want this stuff. We're going to be interested in cases where we're interested in the behavior of some kind of edge holding other things constant, so we need to have notation for talking about that other thing, those other things. So that's what that is. Um, and of course, this applies just as well to random as to non random quantities. Okay. So, having swallowed the notation, um, let's talk about something more interesting. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to begin at the beginning with random graphs. And um, when I talk about them today, I'm going to be um, utilizing something called exponential family form. Something's called exponential random graph form. Um, and it looks like this. So, the basic idea is that if you take some order in random graph, this graph, random graph on n vertices, um, uh, with we represent it through its adjacency matrix on some kind of um, support among the set of possible graphs on n vertices. We can write down the PMF of that distribution um, as follows, um, where we have um, the probability of taking a particular value as being proportional to an exponentiated linear predictor. Okay, and so what is this thing? Uh, well, to explain what this is, I think it's useful to think about, I, I like to use a sort of metaphor of an extremely bright small child trying to come up with how to model a graph. Okay? There are other ways to get this development, but this is the, the small child development, you can call it. Okay, so you have this, mathematically, this mathematical wizard small child who says, okay, I want to figure out how to write down models for graphs that have unusual properties, because that's the kind of thing these kids do these days. Um, and so you might say, how would they do it? So let's say they, they wanted, I, gee, I want a graph that's got lots of triangles in it, because I'm fond of triangles. Um, so how might I accomplish that? Well, they might say, okay, well, I'm going to assign um, probability to every graph um, that's just sort of proportional to the number of triangles that it has in it. Okay, and you say, well, that's a nice idea, but of course that's not going to be a probability in general. Um, you know, and so how do I make this thing be a probability? Okay, well, if I have some kind of, say, um, a linear function of features like number of triangles or edges or other things in the graph. Um, well, I can, uh, first of all, because I have to make it non-negative, okay, so if I had, say, um, I want to have lots of triangles but not lots of edges, I might want to put a positive weight on triangles, negative weight on edges, but now I might have something that could go negative. Okay, well, I can fix that, says the small child. I'll just exponentiate it, okay, so now it's non-negative. I'm smart, okay, but then you point out, ah, small child, you didn't think about everything, did you? Because to me, a probability has got to sum to one over the support, and they say, okay, I'll just take that thing and I'll just calculate it for every possible graph and I'll just add it up and divide, okay, and normalize. And now it sums to one, so it's a probability, okay? And that's that, okay, that's exactly what this is, okay, only it wasn't created by small children, um, to my knowledge. Um, so uh, what this thing is, uh, is that we have this uh, thing T, which is a vector of the statistics of the model, okay? Um, and these could be functions, usually they're functions of the graph, they could also be functions of covariance. Um, but intuitively, you could think about this as features of the network um, that might be biased, that we might see more of them in the model than we would expect by chance, or fewer. Okay? And that more or fewer is determined by a parameter vector, a real value a parameter vector theta, that we multiply by it. So if we put a positive uh, value on theta, then graphs that have more of t are uh, more likely, and negative means um, that we're suppressing whatever is in that element of t. Okay, and then we just, to make it a probability, um, we just um, uh, divide by this normalizing factor. In, in physics, this is called a partition function, which is just the sum of the same quantity over the support. Okay, um, which, of course, turns out, in fact, in, in, in much of the, if you go to other talks and this sort of thing, um, they spend half their time talking about this because this is the nightmare creature that makes our lives difficult because this sum is over something like, you know, two to the n squared things, which is big, okay, when n is anything. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, we're not going to deal with that today. Um, and then I just have a term here that's just an, an indicator function that says, am I in the support or not, and suppresses it if we're not in the support. Okay, so this is what all this really does. Um, but it turns out to be really handy uh, for thinking about um, network models. Um, and why are uh, we so excited by this stuff, and why do you hear all this stuff about exponential and graphs and ergrams and all that, um, other than the fact that we like them? Um, the reason is, uh, first and foremost, because this is a very general framework. It is a fully general framework for PMFs um, on this type of support. Um, in fact, actually, you can generalize it. You can do it on any countable graph support. Um, but certainly for any finite graph support, uh, it's obviously quite easy to do. Um, and so that what I mean by that is if you give me any PMF you want, I can always write it down in this form. Maybe not elegantly, okay, but it can be done. And, um, and so that means that if you, this is sort of a lingua franca for expressing network models. 
Just to clear up a, um, a confusion that I think is, is uh, endemic these days with this stuff, that also, of course, means that there's no actual content in this to speak of, right? I mean, this is a class of models as a statistician uses the term, but not as a scientist usually uses the term. That is, I, I'm not making any, any particular assumptions about what's in this thing. You could put subjects of minimal regularity conditions. You could put anything in here you wanted. Um, and, um, and so the mere fact that you've written it down in this form doesn't, doesn't tell you anything. This is just a, a framework for representing models. So if someone says, oh, I heard about these ERG models and none of them work, they're, it's a bad, um, they're, they're all bad models, what they're saying is, I've heard of network models, network models are bad and no network model works. Okay, that's what they're, they don't think they're saying that, but what, that's what they're, um, what they were saying. So this is just a general framework, okay. Now, the other thing about having a general framework that's nice is that we have a lot of machinery around this form. So once we can get a model in this form, there's a lot of statistical theory to be brought to bear if I want to do things like estimate this. Um, there are methods we have for simulating networks um, that are written down in this way um, using MCMC. It can be very expensive, but there are ways that we can do it. So the other reason we like this framework is that if we can take our model that we developed in whatever way, coerce it into this language, right, we now know how to operate on it. Um, and so there's a lot of advantage in doing things this way. But I want to emphasize, though, for today is that I'm working in this framework here, as we'll see, because it gives us some mathematical advantages. But in doing so, right, this is, this is sort of generic. And so that's why I often call these things general random graph models, just to emphasize the idea that, um, you know, we could put any kind of class you want um, into this uh, sort of thing. It's not a, um, any particular um, assumption that we're going to make. Okay. So that's this sort of idea um, about a sort of general random graph model. Um, and then the question then is, okay, if I give you something of this kind because it's totally general, it's not obvious how you're going to learn anything about it. Um, other than, as I said, you could, you could simulate it. But in particular, right, in order to get anything clean analytically, right, you'd have to look at the properties of this. In general, this doesn't have good properties for any class that you really care about. Okay, there's some special cases, but in general, um, you know, it's hard to know what to do with this, uh, with this monstrosity. So the question is, what can we do? Can we do anything at all? Um, and if the answer was no, you wouldn't be here. Um, so I wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> we wouldn't be here on this particular talk. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, an approach to trying to, to do something about that problem. Um, and I'm going to start by um, changing my view of the model. So uh, what I showed in the previous um, slide was this sort of holistic view of the network. Okay? We take the network as an entire entity. We have statistics of the network as an entire entity. We set the probability of the graph as a function of the network as a whole thing. It's a giant multinomial, if you like. Okay, but we can think about the network model another way. right? We've got an adjacency matrix. It's full of cells. Every cell can be thought of as a random variable. It's just an indicator for whether an edge is present or not. Um, and so we could take then the joint distribution of Y in terms of its component parts and just write it down in a kind of hierarchical form. That is, well, as a generality, we can think about this as, well, the uh, joint PMF of Y is just the PMF of the first element marginalized over everything else times the second element given the first marginalized over everything after it, and so on and so forth. Okay, So we could just think about it as, going through all the cells of the matrix in lexical order, um, conditioning on everything that has come before, and marginalizing over everything that comes after. Right? There's nothing special about that. That's just a way to write down this distribution. Okay? Um, and this might seem like a pretty useless thing to do, because, of course, every one of these things right, marginalizes a bunch of stuff. So now I've replaced one, giant, one distribution with this intractable normalizing factor into you know, something on the n squared um, distributions with intractable normalizing factors. Uh, making our lives even worse, um, or so it would seem. Um, but as you might suspect, there is a workaround that we can use um, to make uh, to, to get some leverage here. Okay, so to see that, um, I'm going to start by um, just uh, well, let's forget about networks for a minute. Just think about in general random uh, general random vector because I think it's easier to start there. So I'm going to let x here just be a um, a random vector um, on some discrete um, support. Right? Obviously, we can do for x just what we did a minute ago. We can write down its joint PMF in hierarchical form, so just the marginal, pro, the marginal PMF of the first um, times, the, um, times the second element given the first, the third element given the first two, and so forth, all the way down. Um, and then we might ask ourselves, okay, if we consider one of these elements in that sequence, these if we like partial conditionals or partial marginals, um, uh, whichever, how, whatever you'd like to call it, um, if we were to write out what that thing is, so this is the distribution of xi given um, the uh, things that uh, came before it, right? That's going to be by definition just the sum over all of the possible realizations of the stuff that could come after of uh, the full conditional of x sub i, okay, given the whole rest of the vector, that is everything other than the i element, 
times the probability that the rest of the stuff takes whatever value that, um, uh, that we're looking at here, right, um, for x prime. So we're going to go with all the possible other realizations. We sum over all those realizations of the other stuff um, and uh, take the prob marginal probability of that um, and then um, the conditional given that. Okay, so the ith marginal is the convex combination, the full conditional is x of i. Okay, that's just, a, there's nothing magical about that. That's just the definition of this sort of marginalization. Okay, but there's an interesting implication of this, because we think about this, right, we don't, this is a, a nasty thing, it's a huge sum, okay, in general, we can't necessarily work with it, and it involves these numbers, and we don't know what these numbers are, but we know something about these numbers. We know their probabilities, right? We know they jointly sum to one, we know they're inside zero at one, so this is a convex combination, right? This is a weighted average of these full conditionals. And if it's a weighted average of the full conditionals, that means that we, uh, whatever this number is, and we don't know what it is, it can't be any less than the minimum of the full conditionals, right? And it can't be any greater um, than the maximum of the full conditionals, right? Because it's some kind of weighted average of them, okay? That follows from convexity, right? And so that means that if we can bound our, um, these full conditionals, this might give us some insight into where this number is. So just kind of graphically to sort of illustrate this, and we start out and we think, well, I have no idea what this, um, what this uh, partial marginal probability could be. It could be anywhere in 0, 1. Well, I know something. At least it's in the 0, 1 interval. Um, okay, but if we think about, um, about this value, right, if we take the maximum and uh, the uh, minimum of the full conditionals, we know that, of course, all of the in particular full conditionals like, live inside this interval. And since the thing that we care about, right, is uh, just a convex combination of those things, then whatever this uh, number is, and we don't know what it is, we know it's got to live here somewhere. All right, so it's somewhere between this and this. All right, so the intuition, right, is that if I know how to get that, and I know how to get that, if I have, that happens to be true, and that's easy to get, then at least I have some bounds on where this thing lives. Okay, and we might hope maybe these bounds are even tight. But why it's okay, so why is this helpful? This kind of foreshadows why we care about that. And, and um, of course, you might think, well, that's lovely, but um, you know, I, I'd have to know what those full conditionals are, and how is that going to help me? Ah, okay, but we can exploit something now. In particular, we can exploit a well-known advantage of this exponential family form, and that is that the exponential family form makes full conditionals very easy to obtain. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why we leverage this thing. We use full conditionals to do MCMC. We use them to do um, inference. We use them for all kinds of good stuff. Um, and it turns out, so here's the form they take. So if I'm interested in the probability of yij um, uh, uh, given everything else in the graph. So if I condition all other states, so this is the full conditionals, okay, um, and everything else, it turns out that this is just a Bernoulli random variable um, whose parameter is the inverse logit of... This thing here, called a, which we call a change score, okay, and this is the change in the sufficient statistics that you get if you have the edge in question present versus it being absent. So how many more triangles would there be if this edge were present versus absent? How many, um, um, uh, how many more edges would there be if this edge was present or absent? The answer would be one, of course. Um, so forth, right? Just multiplied by my, um, by my parameter vector. Okay, so this is, um, this is uh, the, gives us the chance of this thing being um, present. Right, so this is a very simple form, and this sort of inverse logit relationship, which came up actually in, in Mark's talk um, the other day, right, is sort of why this, this thing can, it actually works a little like logistic regression, of course, just conditionally. Um, and actually, that's one of, one of the early approaches trying to estimate parameters of these models exploited this condition um, by saying, well, let's in fact pretend that these um, conditionals for every, um, for every one of these edges, um, in fact, had all the information we needed. Well, we might actually just then um, compute these things um, given the rest of the graph and then um, uh, the rest of the observed graph and then just fit a, a logistic regression here. And that's called a maximum pseudo likelihood estimator if you do that. Um, turns out it's not good and you shouldn't do it in general. Um, but, um, but it just is an example of where people have leveraged that idea. Okay, so what's nice about this, right, is this is a pretty simple form. And often for the models we care about, the extrema of those full conditionals can be found relatively easily, often analytically. That is, we know the behavior of this statistic. We often know how it, it varies over the set of graphs. And sometimes it's very easy to figure out, if I add an edge or take an edge away, how much that thing could change by. Okay, so I know those bounds. And sometimes I know them, again, analytically even. Okay, and if I know them analytically, I can even get results, potentially, um, that don't depend on having to simulate something. Um, and so this can be, um, as we'll see, a, a pretty useful sort of idea. And okay, and this is going to take a minute to load my picture. Okay, here we go. So just again to, um, to sort of illustrate this, let's consider a, a particular case. And this is a model we're going to talk about 
again a little bit later. Um, this is the edge triangle model. Um, it's a very well motivated model that has the misfortune of being lousy. Um, but at the moment, I'm going to use it for expository purposes. So we're going to imagine a very simple family of models that's got two elements in it that we're going to weight. The number of edges in the graph and the number of triangles in the graph. Okay, and you might think about why would you do that? Well, let's imagine that you want to have a model. You want to set on average how many edges there are um, uh, and uh, the density. And you might want to have a bias for more or fewer triangles than you'd expect otherwise. So this might be a way you could do it. Again, not necessarily a great one, but, um, but it's a very natural one. So if we think about that model, um, well, what's the, let's just think about the, the um, conditional probability of an edge, the full conditionals uh, for a given thing, right? That's going to be just the, from what we said before, the inverse logit of um, uh, the first parameter times the change in the number of edges for having an edge present versus absent, which is just one, but I'm going to write it out anyway. Um, and then plus the, number, the change in the number of triangles, um, uh, which obviously is going to depend on the rest of the graph. So here's, this one is contingent, right? This depends on what else is in the graph, and the other one doesn't. Um, and so if we were then to work out our, uh, what our full conditionals could be, right, it turns out they can take three different values in this case. Um, and here just the ordering is based on the idea that this is a positive parameter, so say we have increased clustering. So we're going to have a bunch of cases in which um, if this is our focal edge, they have no shared partners. So in this case, adding the edge or not is not going to change the number of triangles. Okay, so in this case, the um, probability of the edge is just, um, the conditional probability of the edge is just the inverse logit of state of one. Um, then, of course, we've got another set of possible realizations where we would have one triangle that would be changed. Um, and in that case, we get theta 1 plus theta 2 inside the inverse logit. And then finally, um, there are two cases where there would be two triangles added or removed by putting that edge in place. Okay, and then um, we would wind up with um, theta 1 plus theta, uh, 2 theta 2. Okay, and the actual marginal for our ij cell, right, is going to be some kind of function of this. Okay, it depends upon the relative probabilities of these states and equilibrium and I don't know what it is, neither does anyone else. But I don't have to, right, because I know, uh, what I do know is I know what these top values and bottom values are. I know what, whatever my value is, it's got to live somewhere in this space. Um, and so what I might do is say, well, okay, I know this, I know this, and I'm going to let them be bounds on that probability. Um, and indeed, we might imagine, well, we could do that for all, um, all of these elements, right, and build a matrix um, of these top levels, these upper bounds, and a matrix of these lower bounds, um, and then try to use that in some way. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, take all of the, for every ij, for every um, edge variable, we're going to um, get the, balance, the upper and lower bounds on the edgewise um, uh, marginals, right? And um, so we're going to define this. So lambda ij here is going to be less than or equal to the minimum over all the graph realizations of the probability of that edge being present. Okay, and Cij is going to be up, upper bound on the probability of that edge being present. That is, over all the possible graphs we could see, um, what's the maximum that probability of that edge being present given um, the rest of the graph? Okay, and then, so I'm going to build two matrices of this. They're obviously um, matrices in, where these elements are in the 0, 1 interval because they're probabilities. Um, and then for convenience, I'm going to define one other matrix, too, which I'm going to call gamma. Um, okay, and so gamma ij is just defined to be the, the actual value of, um, of, the, of the, uh, the ij margin, marginal in our sort of construction, our sequential construction. Now note, this is a random matrix, right? Because this probability depends upon the values of what's come before in this. Okay, so that's a random matrix, but it has a certain kind of structure, and that is that um, the ij cell of gamma can only depend upon the earlier values of gamma, right? It doesn't depend on what comes after, because by definition it's marginalized over everything that comes after. Okay, and that turns out to be useful. Um, because what I'm going to do then, given these um, three matrices, is I'm going, to, um, I'm going to construct a pair of what I'm going to call bounding processes for Y, our random graph. Um, and so here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to start it by defining a matrix R, um, so one more matrix, um, where, the R, where I, R, I, J is just a uniform random variable between 0 and 1. These are random coins, if you like, um, or dice. Um, uh, these are just um, uh, random numbers between 0 and 1, IID. Um, and then I'm going to define matrices uh, L and U, which are going to be dichotomous matrices that are based on thresholding um, uh, the, uh, the uh, lambda and C matrices using R. So in particular, LIJ is equal to 1 if RIJ is less than lambda IJ, um, and uh, UIJ is equal to 1 if RIJ is less than CIJ. Okay, so you can just think about it is that, um, of course, uh, lambda, right, gives a certain threshold probability if 
I you know, roll my dice and I come up with something less than that, then I say, okay, there's an edge there. If it's greater than that, there's not an edge there. And the same thing is going to be done here for C. Um, so if I do that right, I went with two dichotomous matrices. And of course, we could think about these as matrices, but right, they're dichotomous matrices. We could think about these as adjacency matrices, right? We could think about them as producing graphs. Okay, and so um, in, when, when we do that, we think about L and U, or we say that L and U are Bernoulli bounding graphs uh, for Y in their adjacency matrix form. Okay, and note, by the way, we can define, I'll explain what that means in a minute, but note that we can define Y in this way using gamma in exactly the same mechanism, right? So remember, gamma is just by definition the marginal probability of the ij entry given the ones before it. So I can regenerate y from r by just going through those elements in turn um, and setting y ij equal to 1 if gamma ij um, is, uh, is greater than um, r, right? So this is just another way to generate. So this is if you took my sequential representation of y that I started with and you said, how would I simulate that? This is how you <laughs> simulate it, right? It's just a very straightforward um, process. But the key thing here, right, that I, I want to emphasize is that when I build L, U, and Y, I'm using the same random numbers, okay? And so these are, this is, this is, I'm using here, this is the only thing that I use that, that's at all um, not um, uh, fancy, and it isn't even fancy, as as fancy as it gets. I'm using, I use called stochastic coupling, right? So I have these random variables, they're all, they all have the same source of randomness, okay? And I'm going to use that in um, just a minute, okay? So I built these, I built these things here. And so Y, of course, is not in general Bernoulli graph, it might or might not be, but L and U are, because they're fixed matrices that they're based on, okay? Uh -huh. So why, why did you find lambda and psi? So gamma is defined sequentially and the mm -hmm. others aren't. So what, That's right. And why, why not do them all sequentially? Um, because we want these to be fixed matrices. Because, of course, where we're going with this, right, is we're going to want these to be Bernoulli graphs. And the reason we're going to want them to be Bernoulli graphs is because Bernoulli graphs are easy to work with and understand, right? We understand their properties. So well, the thing, they're, yeah. They're still depending on the realizations of the, you, you could have done them sequentially as opposed Well, so the secret is this, these, of course, these values do not depend upon any other realization because we're minimizing or maximizing over all possible realizations. Right, but you could minimize over the realizations of the earlier. That's right, you could. But see, then the problem is this wouldn't turn out to be helpful for us because um, in order to figure out what those things were, right, we would have to, um, uh, we, we would have something that, well, we would have something that wouldn't be stable. But I, I, see, I see where you're going with this. There is actually, I'm not doing it here uh, because I want these to be fixed so that I can study their properties. However, there are contexts where it makes sense to do uh, this type of operation on everything for, so this sort of not marginalization but bounding, but sequentially. Um, and um, I have another paper, which I'm not talking about today, where I use that trick to do simulation of random graphs, that are, so approximate simulation from things. Um, so you can do that type of development. I'm not doing it here because I want these to be, uh, I want these to be fixed and, and, and invariant to R. Um, because doing that gives me a, um, a Bernoulli structure that I can then exploit. So, um, so your intuition is right. You certainly can do, define a structure of that kind, and there are uses of that structure, but that isn't what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, and actually, you might also intuit, by the way, that doing it this way right, results in a looser set of bounds than if you do it sequentially, um, and that's absolutely correct. Um, in this case, we're trading off that looseness for the fact that having a nice fixed parameter for, I, for IJ that doesn't depend upon how I ordered it or whatever else is mathematically very handy. Um, but, but again, there are other contexts where the sequential structure is actually quite nice. Um, and that simulation is one of them, but, well, we can come back to it later. Okay. So, um, so let me uh, explain uh, what I mean when I say these things bound Y. And to do that, I'm going to have to introduce one more um, concept, and then I'll into it, and that's just the idea of subgraph operation, and many of you are familiar with this, but just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, given two graphs, G and H, G is said to be a subgraph of H um, if the vertex of set of G is a subset of the vertex set of H, and the edge set of G is a subset of the edge set of H. Okay, and in this context today, we're only deal we're dealing with things that have fixed vertex sets, so um, we only care about edges. Um, and um, in that context, for adjacency matrices, it has a parallel kind of idea, right? If G is a subgraph of H, that says that, um, that the adjacency matrix of G, all elements are less than or equal to the elements of H, okay? Same kind of thing. Um, so you can think about it like this, like let's say I have a particular graph. If I add edges to the graph, I get a supergraph. If I take the edges out, I get a subgraph, right? It's sort of a natural idea. Um, so the subgraph um, relation obviously imposes a partial order on the set of all graphs, okay? Um, and it turns out that partial order is useful to us. And one of the uh, reasons it's useful 
is that there are a lot of properties of graphs that we care about that are, at least for fixed n, are monotone in the subgraph operator. Okay, that, uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean that if I, um, if I have something like, let's just say, density of a graph, if I add edges to the graph, right, I can only make the density go up. I can't make the density go down. And if I take edges away, right, the density can go down. It can't ever go up. So the density is a monotone function of where you are in that subgraph order. Um, and, of course, that's true for other things, too. So, for instance, let's consider connectedness. So let's imagine just having an indicator variable for whether a graph is connected. Okay? Um, if it's not connected, I might make it connected by adding edges, but I'm not going to make um, the connectedness go any lower. If a graph is connected, I can't make it disconnected by adding edges. Right? Um, and likewise, taking edges away can't make a disconnected graph connected. Right? So connectedness is also a monotone property. Um, and the same thing goes for many other things you care about. Degree scores, um, you know, Bob's degree can only go up if I add edges to the graph. Uh, maximum component size means you use the distance and so forth. So there are many, many things we care about that are monotone in subgraphs, right? So that if you take edges away or add edges, it has a monotone effect on that function. Um, and that's going to turn out to be handy when we look at how this bounding operation works. Okay, so I've said that L and U, these, matri these, these Bernoulli graphs that we generated using this, um, these uh, bound matrices, bound the behavior of Y. And so in what sense is that true? Um, it's true in the following sense. Let's say that I take my random coins, R, right, and I get a realization of them. Okay, for any realization of R, okay, if we let L, a little L, little U, and Y be the realizations of L, U, and Y that stem from that, that, that um, set of random numbers, okay, then it's always going to be the case for any realization that L is a subgraph of Y and Y is a subgraph of U. Okay, that is that if I generate graphs of this method and I look at my unknown graph Y and I look at where L and U are, U is always above it, L is always below it, okay, or equal to it. All right, in, term, in the sense of being a subgraph. Um, and the, um, I won't go into the proof unless we're interested in it. I can go to it, but it's a pretty immediate thing. Because basically, what I'm exploiting is the fact that I generate these by thresholding. Thresholding is monotone. So it, it turns out that um, this, um, this fixes uh, that. Um, and that has a, nice, so a number of nice consequences. One, um, one consequence is pretty nice, although on the slide the notation is also possible to read. Um, but um, what, uh, what this is saying is that if I have some statistic I'm interested in the graph, some function of the graph, and it's subgraph monotone, in the sense that I used that term earlier, um, then we can bound the CDF of that statistic on Y um, by the CDF on L and U. Okay, and so what does that mean in practice? Well, let's take any raw moment of F on Y. So the mean, for instance, okay, the expectation. Um, that moment is bounded by the corresponding moments on L and U. So if you consider, say, the mean degree on Y, which I don't know what it is because Y is some hideously complex model. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. Okay, I don't know what it is, but I can bound it by the mean degree on L and U because mean degree is a monotone property. Okay, um, and of course, L and U are Bernoulli graphs, so that may be a very easy thing to figure out. Okay, and let's take something else. Let's say um, we're interested in whether, uh, whether Y is connected. Okay, a very complex property, very hard to deal with. Um, but I can think about that as just being the expectation of an indicator variable. So the probability that Y is connected is bounded by the probability that L is connected and the probability that U is connected. Right? So I know it has to be somewhere in there. Um, and this is sort of, again, we can apply this logic to any raw moment, to any quantile. If I want to take, say, the median degree or anything else, right, because the CDF bounds it. Um, and the like for any, um, any um, uh, subgraph monotone property. Okay, and so this is why this whole the construction is useful, right? We can, um, we can take something we're interested in and we can use the properties of L and U to bound the graph that we understand. Okay, so this is um, so this is the basic idea, right? So from our little corollary, we can bound the behavior of an arbitrary random graph as long as we can coerce it into the right form um, by examining the behavior of the associated Bernoulli graphs, and we call those Bernoulli graph bounds. Um, we can get them from any subgraph monotone property, and as I said, a lot of the things we care about fall in that category. Um, so connectedness, density, mean degree, individual degrees, quantiles of degrees, <coughs> maximum component size, closeness, all kinds of good stuff uh, we can, um, we can uh, do with this. Now, not everything falls in this category, right? So there are things that we can't do. Um, for instance, ratios of, um, of monotone statistics are not necessarily monotone, okay, or differences. So there are limits, okay, but... Um, nevertheless, there's a lot of stuff that we, uh, we can get with this. Um, and of course, in some cases, right, we might get these bounds numerically. Say I, um, I generate this Bernoulli graph structure, I simulate the Bernoulli graphs and look at the properties. But in some cases, we can get things analytically. And 
And the reason we can do that is because there's an awful lot of classical random graph theory about Bernoulli graphs. This is why I wanted to force for this into Bernoulli graph land, right? You can, um, you can get you know, uh, books and books and books on random graph properties and their asymptotics and so forth. Um, and so if I can coerce my uh, system into the Bernoulli world, now I have all that mathematical machinery that I can use. Um, and um, again, even if we have to simulate, at least we're simulating Bernoulli things, and that's a relatively easy um, kind of thing to do. Okay, so just to sort of put it all together and summarize the approach, right, here's the procedure. One, um, you know, get yourself a random graph model, and how you do that is your problem for today's lecture. Um, but I assume that you've done it. Um, write it down in ERG form, which can always be done, okay, perhaps um, with pain, okay, but it could be done. Um, use that, use the full conditionals then to derive your lower and upper bound threshold matrices. Um, Use that then to create L and U, um, just by treating them as Bernoulli graphs with these parameter matrices, um, and examine the behavior of your desired property, as long as it's monotone, on those graphs, either analytically or uh, by a simulation, um, and then use the behavior of F on your graphs to describe the behavior on Y. Okay, so what we have done in doing all this, right, is we have taken a problem involving general random graphs that is very hard to a problem involving Bernoulli graphs, which are less hard. Okay, I won't say easy, but much easier, at least in some cases. Okay, and so that's the um, core idea. Okay, so uh, what I uh, want to do now in the remaining time is show you a couple of examples of this, um, hopefully convincing you that this is more than a mere curiosity, um, although you know it's kind of fun as a curiosity too, um, and it's actually good for something. Um, so why do we want to set these boundaries? What, what good does it do us? Um, well, there are a lot of things we can do with it, um, a couple which I'll show you, but um, we might, for instance, use it to try to identify potentially pathological models. So maybe I have an idea of what might go into a random graph model. Um, I'm interested in whether it has good properties, and it might be, say, hard to simulate, or I want to know what happens if I, say, let n become very large. Um, I, can, um, I can use the bounds to see whether or not it might have pathological properties. For instance, um, as one example we'll look at in a minute, does density go off to infinity, or well, off to, up to 1, um, as, um, as the graph becomes large, for instance. Uh, more generally, there'll be other asymptotic properties that we want to understand, okay? And in general, it's not obvious how you do asymptotics, but in this kind of world, right, if I could get an analytical expression for the behavior of, um, of my bounding graphs, right, then I may be able to extrapolate that. And if I think about series of graphs of increasing size, be able to say what that um, properties that has, um, uh, what properties those have. Um, we can use them to do other kinds of things, look at, at necessary or sufficient conditions for the emergence of structural features, robustness testing, I'll show an example of that in a minute, model approximation, lots of stuff. Okay, so there are lots of things we can do with it. Now, I will caution up front, um, and I'm not going to go into detail on this, um, in part because there's a lot that's not known about it, um, but we know these bounds in general are often going to be quite loose. Okay, so I mean, you think of these a lot like Kamogorov bounds, right? They're easy to get, um, they're very general, but they're not necessarily very tight. Um, um, and, uh, but nevertheless, they can often provide useful results. So rather than trying to give you more theorems about the tightness of bounds, which I don't have, um, I'm going to um, do um, a constructive proof. Um, I will show you a couple of examples that are useful and thereby convince you, hopefully, that they can be useful. It is possible for these things to be tight enough to be handy. Um, and, and, in fact, and moreover, I think they can give us some insight. All right. So here's the first example I want to show you, um, and this involves a phenomenon that I'm going to call the density explosion, okay, which sounds more exciting than it is, unless you have a paper deadline and something isn't working, in which case it could get very exciting. Okay, um, so uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to come back to this model I mentioned earlier, um, right, which is in a way almost the simplest sort of credible model for um, uh, triadic clustering. That's a random graph um, with a, a uniform random graph with a bias toward triangle formation. So I started out with a classic kind of quote-unquote erdos renyi graph, even though those, those Erdős and Renyi didn't actually initiate that one, um, but the NP model, so to speak, right, um, homogeneous random graph model, and I'm going to modify it by adding a term, an additional uh, term that in ERG form we write like this. This is just the count of number of triangles in the graph, so this is what we talked about before. Okay, and so the intuition is, right, if I put a positive parameter on that, I'm saying I should get excess triangulation. This is an extremely reasonable thing to do. It makes perfect sense. It, there are many ways to justify doing it. You can think about it in terms of the idea that, um, that for any pair of individuals, every additional shared partner they have, have conditionally um, adds to the law of odds they form a tie. You can derive it from um, uh, using a result called the Hammersley Clifford theorem from uh, the Markov graph conditions that Mark talked about the other day. It's a wonderful idea. It's beautiful, it's simple, it's elegant. It has only one problem, and that is that it's deeply pathological. 
You probably all know people like that too. Um, you know, why is it bad? Okay, and and Mark's actually done a lot of explaining why these kinds of things are often bad. Um, it tends to concentrate mass on mixtures of extremely dense and extremely sparse graphs. For one thing, if we look at the region of the parameter space, it doesn't have bad behavior. It looks very um, strange and is arguably um, I don't think it's been proved, but it seems to be um, uh, vanishing in, in uh, area in n. Um, and in general, it's sort of difficult to work with. And actually, these things, I mean, I'm not, this isn't the sort of subject for today, but um, I can give you a sort of uh, poor man's illustration of what these, these parameter spaces sort of look like. So you can think about it as if I have sort of the you know, um, edge parameter here um, and then triangle parameter here. Uh, Mark's actually shown this in a tail for a closely related model, and the space looks very similar, um, where you have edges and two stars. Um, and um, so what you often get, and the edge two star case actually looks um, exactly like this. Um, but if you look at the graph space and you plot the, the, the area in the param natural parameter space, it doesn't lead to sort of weird results. You get something that looks just freaky, okay? All kinds of weird stuff. And so Mark has a very nice paper where he talks about this, okay? And there are all kinds of weird subtleties about this thing that we don't understand. Um, but anyway, you get weird stuff. And again, the edge triangle model looks, looks um, sort of very similar from the, the um, exploration I've done. Um, Okay, but there's another, so in addition to that, I'm not going to deal with that problem today, but there's another problem that's closely related to it, and that is that if I take, um, however, you know, if I find a model in here that works well, has reasonable properties, and then I were to say, okay, let me extrapolate that model to a larger size. So let's say I go into a group of 15 people, um, I figure out an edge triangle model that works well for them, and I say, okay, let's imagine, I want to know what would this social system do with the same mechanisms if I had, you know, 30 people, 100 people, okay? And you might think, well, I'll just simulate from that network with a larger size. But what you find is when you do that, um, if you look at the, um, the expected density of the graph, um, you know, you see that in fact um, it, it does this sort of crazy thing and becomes really huge as n goes to um, infinity, it goes to 1, okay, and, and um, in fact that's so quite sharply generally. Okay, and so this is a phenomenon I'm going to call the density explosion, okay, the graph becomes extremely dense. Um, and um, the question is, well, can we use this um, methodology to, uh, on the one hand, identify that type of the risk of that, and then also to, to do something about it? So first question is, okay, we know in this case there's density explosion can be found the hard way by simulation, um, although um, uh, uh, David Strauss in an uh, 86 Siam paper basically sort of worked out why that was going to happen, um, uh, though many of us had learned the hard way anyway. Uh, we might ask, well, could the Bernoulli bounds have detected something like this? Okay, and so one way to, to think about this is let's say let's take the Bernoulli upper bound uh, for this model, um, uh, assuming a positive triangle parameter. Um, and so um, to get that, what do we need? Well, we need the maximum conditional edge probability that occurs when the complement graph is complete. Okay, um, that is everybody who can be a shared partner is a shared partner. In that case, if we work out what is um, what is Cij, and it's homogeneous, so this is true for any Ij, it's just um, okay, the inverse logit of uh, this uh, negative of this thing, so it's just um, the two things in it are just our edge parameter, right? The chain square is always one. Um, and then the maximum number of triangles that can be added uh, by adding an edge, and that's just n minus two. Okay, maximum number of shared partners in the graph. Okay, um, and so this is, of course, just a Bernoulli graph that has this as its parameter. Well, we can see what's going to happen with this, right? This is, um, of course, as n goes to infinity, right? This becomes very large. This is a Logit, so this is going to go to 1. Um, and that means that um, u is going to approach um, complete graph on invertices almost surely as n goes to infinity. Okay. Um, and so in a way, this really expresses this idea. Triangle formations model is self-reinforcing. Um, and so once you start to get triangles, you, you get graphs that are, that are very close to complete. Okay. Now, this is, of course, an upper bound. So one thing we have to keep in mind is that doesn't guarantee the fact the upper bound has bad behavior doesn't guarantee the model has bad behavior. But it's not reassuring. It definitely tells us something could be very wrong. Okay, we would be worried about that. Um, so is, if things are bad, um, and they are, um, how can we fix them? Okay, and one nice thing about the bounds here, right, is that they've given us some insight to what's going on, right? That problem is the maximum change score, right, and it's diverging. And if we look at this, we look at the form of this, we might say, well, how can I keep that from diverging? Because I know if I can keep that thing stable, then in, in the upper bound, the upper bound is not going to go off to, uh, the density is not going to go off to one. If it doesn't go off to one, then I can't get density explosion. It's not possible. Um, and so how can I do that? Well, you know, I might think, gee, if only I could divide this by n, right? That would make sense. And I could do it, but what would it mean? Well, there's a natural way to think about that, and that is to say, instead of counting triangles, what if I think about the triangle degree? Um, so what if I think about the num average number of triangles per vertex, okay? The average number of triangles that you're part of, okay? Well, that's just sort of three, that number divided by n, 
Okay, and so the triangle degree then gives us something that has a slightly different form. This is now the maximum change score. Well, as n goes to infinity, right, this becomes 1. So this is just now, as a upper bound, it's a fixed um, number, right? So the log odds of a tie are increased now over the baseline by at most 3 uh, theta, okay? And so density has to be stabilized, right? So we fixed it. It's kind of nice, right? Um, and we even know how we fixed it. We know why it works, okay, because we can see the res result. Um, and actually, we can go, we can improve this even more if we want to. So um, just to make it sort of another point, right, in most social applications, mean degree is approximately fixed, right? If you can't add friends forever and ever, okay, so um, the density actually shouldn't be stable. The density needs to decline. And so how can we fix that? Well, one natural way to fix that, um, I won't go through the details, but the basic idea is pretty straightforward, is to replace that fixed um, edge parameter by um, a parameter that looks like this, it's the log of beta over n minus 1 minus beta, where beta is the expected degree in the baseline model. Okay, and so then if you do that, this gives you something that stabilizes the expected degree. This actually turns out to be asymptotically exactly equivalent to um, an offset family that um, Pavel Kravitsky and Mark and Martina Morris developed, and um, in fact have a, you know, a forthcoming paper talking about this, and it turns out it has very sort of nice properties. Um, and if we use that kind of model to cut to the chase and we work out the math, what we find is that um, this forces the expected degree asymptotically to be between um, uh, beta and beta times e to the um, uh, 3 theta t. So it's again, so it forces us to have something where the mean degree sort of lives within reasonable bounds asymptotically, which is very nice. If you, by the way, if you have, let this be negative, you get an analogous kind of result. It's sort of the same kind of thing. We can generalize this in other ways as well, right? Because we think about what we just did. Well, gosh, you know, we just used the fact that whatever that thing was that we added to the baseline, that it, it, it had some upper bound. So actually, we can generalize that result to any case where all the terms that we add, right, the change score has an upper or lower bound. So if we can bound them by gamma and gamma prime, then in fact the expected degree in the limit is going to be just the initial baseline expected degree um, uh, multiplied by one of these things, the upper <coughs> bound. So we can scale it above and below by a fixed value. So that stabilizes that. Um, and in fact, if we want to say, well, what if we were interested in triangles? What if we're interested in other things? If we have arbitrary subgraph census terms, of order k, we can, um, we can obviously force the same kind of relationship by dividing that census count by n to the k minus 2, okay, because that's the maximum change score for any such thing, or that the change score scales as, as that polynomial. Okay. And so that's kind of interesting. This actually suggests that this type of scaling is kind of like a natural scale for subgraph census statistics. And those are the statistics that come out of Hammers of Clifford, so they're actually very natural to think about. So this is kind of nice. Once we have this kind of framework, we actually know how we can build models that have um, certain kinds of stability properties. And they may be bad in other ways. I'm not saying if you go out and do this with the triangle model, it'll be good in other respects. But we can at least guarantee it doesn't have certain kinds of pathologies, which is kind of handy. OK. All right. In the last just couple of minutes here, I'm going to quickly show you one more example um, to show you something else you can do with it. And this example um, is a little more sort of numerical in character. Comes from some work I've been doing with uh, John Hip and some other folks on um, spatial models for networks. Um, and so in particular, we're interested in problems where we're trying to model networks on huge scales, so cities, counties, and so forth. Um, and we want to do lots of stuff with it. And that leads us to a problem, well, how do we work with models for networks that are really big, OK, say a million people? Um, if we have sort of models with complicated dependence, um, MCMC methods, whatever, too slow. We can't even simulate these things. Um, so one thing we might hope that we could do is we could maybe use a really powerful covariate, like, say, geography put in a Bernoulli structure and hope that that Bernoulli graph with the good covariates is powerful enough that the dependence we can kind of ignore it. Okay, and so in fact that's uh, what we've been doing. So we're using a family that we call spatial Bernoulli graphs and I won't go through the details, but what this basically says is that this is just an inhomogeneous Bernoulli graph where I have some nonlinear function of distance that determines the probability of tie between two people. Okay, and it's called an SIF, or spatial interaction function. That's all this stuff says is, okay, I've got some kind of function, the probability you're tied to somebody is a function of how far away you are. Okay, and we can simulate models of this kind that we played with. So I'll just give you one example. Um, it's based on extrapolating from some old data from, um, from Festinger and then applying it to um, a uh, particular region. This is Choctaw, Mississippi, about 10,000 people um, using block level from the 2000 census. And the computer is going to churn them it. Here we go. Um, so this is just an example of, of one draw from that network. So here's the actual geography. All these little points are people. Um, and then we use that to get um, a network not laid out by geography. That's one possible realization of this sort of friendship-like structure extrapolated. Okay, and I'm going to how, where the, the fact that I use this particular model is not important for my application right now, um, but just to give you an idea of, okay, we're trying to do this kind of stuff. And this raises a, a question, 
right? Um, in order to do all that stuff, right, I had to make this really, really painful assumption, which is that the edges are all totally independent given the covariate, right? And we know it's wrong, all right? Um, the real network's going to have dependence mechanisms like endogenous clustering and the like. Um, and the question is, how bad is that model that I just used, right? Uh, we might hope that maybe the covariate is powerful and we don't have to care that it has these unmodeled dependencies, but we don't know. So, for instance, one thing that might be going on, so proposed in the literature, is there might be local triangulation. So that is, if I, if, if, um, if I and J are close together, and they have third parties they're both tied to that are also close to them in space, they have opportunities to meet each other and run into each other, okay? And that may increase the chance that they form a tie. Okay, and we can capture that by a statistic that's just a local version of the triangle statistic. It's just the count of all triangles on people who are all within some distance tau of each other. Okay, and so this is a sort of simple idea. We can then, um, if we write down our model in exponential family form, we can just add that to it, and then we get, this is the change score. So this is then the conditional edge probability. Okay, but this is now a dependence term. So, you know, this is no longer something that um, we can use in a straightforward way. Uh, we might want to ask, well, how much impact could this local triangulation have on the model? We didn't, we didn't use it. How bad could it make things for a particular application? And so we have to decide what the application is. I'm going to use just one sample application, and that is, let's say that you're interested in the question of if you inserted a rumor into Choctaw, Mississippi, okay, and whoever got them were told everyone they knew, who told everyone they knew, and so forth, okay, what is the expectation of the maximum number of people who could be reached? on average in that community. So it's not a trivial, it's not a trivial property. It's not a simple one. Okay? It's a sort of weighted function of the um, component sizes. Um, but um, it's a monotone property. So there are a lot of complicated things that are still monotone. So it's still subgraph monotone. Um, and so what we're going to ask is, if we took the model we used a minute ago, how large would the triangulation effects have to be before the model's behavior breaks down in this particular way? Okay. So how do we do it? We apply the Bernoulli bounds. In the interest of time, we'll walk through it. But I'm just doing exactly the, I'm turning the crank on the mechanism I used before. I'm looking at the maximum change score. The maximum change score is going to depend upon the number of pairs um, um, who are close and who have a number of third parties that are close to them. So this is a numerical thing. I can't get anything analytically here. But I can simulate that, right? I mean, I can do it given data. I can calculate it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to simulate a bunch of these things. I'm going to drop a rumor into it. I'm going to see what happens. And if I do that, I can characterize the result, say, for the mean diffusion size, mean number of people reached, in terms of two things. One, this is, the, um, this is theta, so this is the strength of the um, triangulation effect in terms of for every shared partner you, uh, pair you have, um, uh, how much does that increase the log odds of a tie? Okay, I'm um, going from zero, so not at all, to 0.5, which is a huge sort of amount on the log logit scale. Um, and then tau, which is the radius of the effect. So how close do people have to be before this kicks in, right? So do they have to be right on top of me? Or can they be, say, two kilometers away, which is quite a long time, you're talking about, or a long distance if you're talking about neighborhood effects. Um, and so we can see that on the baseline, we've got about 103 people that are reached. Um, and if we say, okay, how much do I have to pump these things up before things start to break? We can see, actually, we've got to have pretty substantial distances, okay, on the order of, you know, close to a kilometer or more. Um, and we have to have pretty substantial, generally, um, um, effect sizes in terms of the effect of each shared partner before this really breaks things. And Frank, to get qualitative changes, Okay, relative to the population size, you really need to be down here. Um, and so what this says is, if there is out there in the world this effect, as long as the effect is not really strong, it's not going to change the behavior of the model, this particular behavior of the model. It might change others, but not this one, very, not very much. Um, and in fact, it's even more true if we look at, say, the median. Okay, so we look at the medians here. Notice the median is really small. Okay, and this is actually something people don't realize, but it's true of most diffusion, um, like rumor diffusion things. Most rumors don't diffuse very far, and a few diffuse a long way. So the median is very low. We want to preserve that property, okay? Um, and um, indeed, it turns out that that doesn't break down until we're talking about things where you know it's a common or more, and you're talking about um, each additional shared partner having an enormous effect. Okay, so that's pretty big. Um, so this is reassuring for this particular model. What this says is that if you went out there and used that that Bernoulli graph model, that inhomogeneous Bernoulli graph model, and this type of effect was in the world, as long as it wasn't super strong, you'd be safe in this particular way. Okay, and we could test other effects. We could put other, we can in fact, we can actually use all classes of effects because we could put just an upper bound on how big that clustering term is without worrying about what the source of it is. There are lots of things that we could do to generalize this. But this gives you a flavor of sort of what's possible. Um, and that's nice if you're in a world where you need to be able to approximate complex processes by simple ones. And I think scientifically that's actually a really important thing. Um, because the world's got lots of things going on. We're never going to capture them all. We're never going to model them all. We would like to be able to figure out when can I use a simplified model and not have to worry about everything else. And this gives us at least one, one way of figuring that out. All right, so let me wrap it up. Um, often, of course, we have um, graphs that we've come up with. We've got random graph models. They're hard to work out uh, and study. 
Uh, we need ways of doing that. And so this um, Bernoulli graph thing is one way of doing it, um, where we transform this problem involving these complicated networks into these relatively simple ones where we can utilize either fast simulation or classical random graph theory. Um, we talked about a couple of applications here today. Um, one to parameterization and asymptotics, another one to robustness. Um, and uh, there are lots of nice things one can do with that. Um, there are, of course, lots more work to be done on this. As I said, um, you know, I don't have a simple characterization for the tightness of the bounds here. I won't guarantee that they're tight. In fact, we know that, in fact, they're relatively loose. Um, you can find tighter ones in general, um, but they're not easy to compute. Um, and that, of course, is the issue. So in this case, what we're doing is we're, we're trading off the sort of precision of these things for the tractability. And that's um, kind of the goal in this particular case. But it's interesting to go back and say, are there ways to get tighter bounds? Or if we consider non-Bernoulli graph families, are there other graph families that are simple to work with that we could use to produce bounds, say using latent variable models, um, that would, uh, would uh, work in the same kind of way, sort of interesting kind of thing. And obviously lots more applications. All right, with that, I will uh, wrap it up. So thanks for your attention. And if anyone's interested, uh, we have, in fact, an IMBS tech report uh, that you can download and read um, if you uh, would like all the gory details. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, I mean, that both are, are, are very good um, points. And actually, there are a lot of the models that, you know, we're interested in, um, uh, of course, have really lousy mixing properties. And so that is a real concern with the MCMC. Um, I actually have played with that a little bit. And I think there would be some context where that's helpful. Now, the downside is often, of course, the, um, in the cases where the MCMC mixes the worst are often where the bounds are loosest. And that actually is, they stem from that, um, the, the difference between the upper and lower change scores. And so it's actually the same kind of phenomenon that makes the MCMC bad. Makes, the, uh, makes these bounds um, more loose, which is, of course, you, know, you can't get something for nothing. Having said that, though, um, it still can be the case that you know, even if the bound is loose, it can, in some cases, still give you some, as you say, some quality control that, OK, I know that this thing shouldn't be hanging. You know, if I'm observing my, my current running estimates are way out here, and I know they have to sit in this space, and something is definitely wrong. Um, whether that can be kind of easily automated well enough to make it kind of um, completely plug and play, I'm not sure, but I think it's a very nice idea. Another one, of course, is, is thinking about can you use this for approximate inference, right? Because, of course, we know for the exponential families, at least in, you know, say, the regular exponential family case, um, the MLEs um, for these models are what set the expected statistics equal to the observed statistics. Um, and so, of course, in this case, I can derive, in some cases, bounds on the expected statistics. So I could use that in principle to put bounds on the parameters. Um, I haven't worked on that yet. It seemed like an obvious thing to do. My, in, my intuition has been, given what I have played with, that um, in the cases where you'd really like that to work, the bounds are usually loose enough that that's going to be probably more crude than what you could get with MPLE or related methods. But I don't know. I mean, there might be, um, you know, there, I mean, it hasn't been much explored. I mean, there might be cases where, in fact, that actually still works very well. Especially, and this is one of the things that I think was revealed by that last example, um, when you have a really powerful baseline effect, right, so when a lot of the conditional type probability is really determined by covariates, right, you can add a lot of dependence to the model, right, and it doesn't change a whole lot. And the uh, bounds pick that up very well. So the bounds can be actually in practice really very tight when you're dealing with those inhomogeneous cases. Um, where the worst case scenario are these massively homogeneous models where conditional type probabilities could vary a lot, but because, of course, we can't identify any permutation, right, in the sense that that the edge that kids very high probability, the edge very low probability, kind of um, in terms of the way they affect the bounds, it's sort of like you, um, uh, you know, were, uh, well, it's sort of a geometric analogy, but you have something very narrow, very wide, and you rotate it around a lot, of course, you're going to create a big, big wide shape. Um, you think about like a lathe or something. Um, it's sort of a, a little like that because you're scraping out the maximum and the minimum as you rotate this around over all possible um, 
orientations as IJ pairs. Whereas in the inhomogeneous case, like this particular IJ, its values are relatively pinned down, and if this one is high and this one is low, that's pinned down by the covariance. Um, so in that kind of context, you know, could it be an eight estimation, you know, possibly? Um, but I mean, I think we, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's going to matter quantitative. We're going to have to see how, what it, how it works out. I mean, I, I don't think there are going to be any magic solutions in that, just because so many people have tried in so many contexts to find magic solutions, and so far they all tend to lead us right back to the same place. But, um, but I, it's a very interesting set of problems. There, so. There's a large interest in developing on, um, on graph theoretic models and spread of infectious diseases, mm -hmm. influenza models. Have these met methods and, uh, had much effect on or people? The, the Muslim models I've seen are really brute force methods in which people do huge simulations. Um, have there been applications of these? Um, well, there are applications of that, but I'm, I guess I'm, I'm which 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 applications of these to what are you thinking of? And in, in, in well, I was thinking of the, of the, the large simulation mm -hmm. models of, uh, of mm -hmm. cities like Portland, et cetera, where people have been using graph theoretical methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there, is, um, there is a lot of work on trying to use random graph models to, um, of, of this family, this sort of, sort of ilk, to, um, to do simulation modeling. And I know Mark was raising his probably point, want to chime in on that, because um, you've been involved in a lot of that stuff. I've been a little bit, but you've worked directly. Yeah, for example, um, I'm a PhD student who's just finished um, Gail Potter. She's working with the group in Seattle, Ira Long. Oh, with Mark Hale Morris, too, you mentioned yesterday. Yes. Um, yes, they're in the same group there. So Gail, uh, yes. Um, and she's actually just finished her PhD thesis where she does within family uh, modeling and social networks using this class of models, then within school and then within work workplace. And her thesis combines them to, to, together in the global sim, sim flu simulation model. So this is Lil Jean and Lil? Yeah, Ira and uh, Beth Halloran. So yeah, she, in a nutshell, what she has done is brought this class to do within social modeling to plug in, if you will, within that broader model. Great. And it appears to work extremely well. Well, Carter talked about monotonicity hypothesis. You know, you had some problems in that with the particle ordering. What kind of monotonicity did you look at monotonicity hypothesis and get involved on that? Oh, no, I was actually referring to the more general class of okay. urban okay. models. I don't think she's, she's not actually using... Yeah, I doubt these results have been used yet because they haven't been around for very long yet, but... Um, but you could. I mean, that's the that's sort of my, my thinking on that. I mean, and Dave Hunter is also doing work of, of this sort of kind. So there's a lot of interest in trying to take what we learn about how to model how, how to model networks in this kind of approach because it says so many nice statistical properties to then sort of take it back, combine it with other kinds of epidemiological um, approaches. And the, one of the challenges in that area has been that you know and we can do it, and, and I think there have been you know nice successes so far, say on the HIV end. Um, but I mean, you know, often you have to do big brute force simulations of things, and um, you know, it, it can be um, not very trivial to do. Oh, well, I don't want to, you know, imply that people aren't doing a good job of it. But um, it would be nice, from my point of view, if we could then use some of these kinds of techniques to then, you know, you take a real, you know, a more realistic sort of detailed complex model, and then say, okay, you know, if we use some sort of reasonable bounding kinds of um, um, techniques on it, can we can we pull out the major factors in the behavior of that and, and simplify them in some way? Um, and they're still tied at the end of the day, day to that complex underlying network process so that you didn't do it by just arbitrarily imposing conditions, right? You do it in a principled way, um, uh, but you may still get simplicity out at the end of the day. I mean, this is, of course, my own bias. I, I at the end of the day, you know, although I, I've been accused, Kim has accused me of being a complexifier at various points. And, you know, um, I try not to do that. But I, it is true that I sometimes do wind up adding a lot of complexity to the world. So at least with something like this, I'm trying to do penance and taking it back out again. Um, and, and getting some, something that lets us try to simplify the complexities that we've added uh, where, where we can. Any other questions? Maybe one question. I just have one very yeah. quick one. So for, um, a lot of uh, social network models, you would expect uh, the uh, network to be closer to the upper bound for the reason you've given. Yeah. So when the mixing is bad, the ones we sort of want to use and struggle to actually fit, you expect them to be closer to the upper bound than the lower bound. I wonder if you could use that empirical fact to exploit. So the upper bound is going to be important, the lower bound isn't. So I wonder, A, is that true in your experience, if you had enough experience to say, and, and B, can you exploit that to improve your 
Yeah, I think that's often true. Um, I in, in the kinds of in, it's a function of the way we build the model, so it's not like uh, some sort of generic thing. But it's because often when we think about the way social effects work, our intuition is often um, I've got a low chance of being tied to anybody, period. And then there are factors that make ties more likely. So we start at a low baseline and we add things. And in that kind of world, right, the upper bound is, is going to, you have all these sort of positive effects you're interested in, and, and the upper bound is going to be the thing that, that mostly matters. So my, my intuition is that usually we will be much closer to the upper than the lower, because in, in those kinds of models, it's not always true, but it can often be true that, frankly, the lower bound is just the baseline Bernoulli graph, right? And so, um, uh, which actually still can be handy in some cases, but it's not necessarily all that interesting. It's, it becomes powerful if you have, again, sort of in homogeneity, you have mixing parameters, things like that. Then that actually can be a very powerful lower bounding surface. But often we have this idea of a kind of lower bounding kind of Bernoulli surface, if I can abuse terminology, um, to which we've added these kind of density peaks based on, on these endogenous things. Um, I, I think that's right, right. And in principle, we should be able to use it. Now, the, the downside is that you know, we would like to have some way of then saying, how close are you to the upper bound, right? And sort of have some kind of refinement of the lower bound that based on that, at least a stochastic refinement. Um, I don't have any such result um, to offer. Um, I think it would be wonderful um, to have one. Um, I have some reviewers who would love to have one at the moment. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't have that at, the, at, at present. But I think it, it's something that one could investigate, yeah. Well, one potential suggestion is to start with graphs at the upper bound and then use essentially within the process of the sim simulation a stochastic simulation to bounce you off the top through a sequence of graphs that's down to move you from hmm. the max to create an envelope below the actual max. Um, that means you would no longer have an exact method, you'd be an approximate method, but it might actually perform extremely well. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting ways you could use this these types of ideas to get approximations, even beyond sort of that. I mean, so you could think about, once you, once you realize, oh, wow, we have this convex combination thing, you could think, well, maybe there are other kinds of ways we could take estimates. And, and actually, you know what mean field quote-unquote approximations yeah. do, that they could be thought of as essentially taking kind of like an average of that. But you can think about other approximations as well. Um, and, um, you know, it might be interesting to combine the methods. So, for instance, you could use one approximation if you want to get this sort of refinement. You have an upper bound that's tight, or, well, it's exact, um, anyway, it's, um, it's an actual bound. And then you have this kind of approximate lower bound uh, um, that, that you've shifted up. And so you don't know that one is, is correct, but you know that, um, that it's at least, you know, reasonably good. Um, and uh, you have an upper one which is, which is uh, fixed. And it might be that in practice that will do a good job of pinning things down. Yeah, I have. I mean, I, it's totally wide open as far as I'm concerned. I think it's, but I think it's very interesting. This perspective on thinking about models, I think, can be very illuminating, in, in my experience. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Carter. Thank you.